Story 1. She Followed The day was coming to an end and I had just finished my chores. Putting all the horses away into their stables is harder than it sounds. Normally we leave them out, but it had been cold at night, and my dad didn't want to risk losing the smaller horses due to the weather. At least, that's what he told me. I was an only child, and my family had a small farm up in the upper peninsula of Michigan. There had been a few times at night, I would hear the horses whine and my father run out there with a shotgun, sometimes firing out into the night, or worse, he'd be out there for hours before coming back in. He would never admit the truth, but both me and my mom knew that the larger predators would come down from the north. Up here we had bears, wolves, and even a stray cougar every now and then, but those were quite uncommon. For fun, I would ride dirt bikes, play airsoft, and trap small game. Right now, it was too cold to play, well, at least for my friends, but I still had trapping, which made me a little bit of money on the side. I was getting quite good at it, and I was making good money, but my parents hated the idea of me going off into the woods alone, and potentially getting eaten. I would carry a small 410 shotgun, which would take care of the small game, but it wouldn't do much against the larger predators that were deep within the woods. Seeing how my time was limited, and not letting daylight determine my ability to harvest for animals, I bought some low-quality night vision goggles to help aid me in trapping small game. I wouldn't use them for very long, but it made life much easier than using a flashlight and potentially scaring away the animals that were caught in my traps. I marched over to the woods as light continued to dim and got my goggles ready. The nice thing about the goggles is that I'd also use them while playing airsoft, but after a few games, no one else would play with me since I had an unfair advantage. I had a couple dozen traps set up, many of which were by small streams that ran deep into the woods, but I had become more adventurous and began setting up more beyond. In recent events, this proved to be beneficial as I was able to capture a couple of mink and badger which are hard to come by. I went to my first couple of traps and some of which had been set off but nothing was in them. This was a common issue, but I wasn't surprised. A lot of times this was due to the traps going off on their own, mainly because not being properly set, which was frustrating. However, these were not my high-valued locations, so it was okay. The sun had completely set now, and I turned on my goggles. My vision was filled with a bright green view of the woods. The technology was quite impressive. I continued checking on more traps, and finally found a brown rabbit stuck in one of my snares. At this point, it was dead, but its body was still soft, which means it must have died recently. I removed it from its trap, placing its lifeless body in my satchel, and rebaited the trap. I checked my other snares before crossing the river. I continued hiking deeper into the woods, when I finally saw another one of my traps had been set off, but I noticed something odd. Blood covered the trap, and on the ground next to it was a weird device. At first, I thought it was some kind of decorative pipe, it was some kind of bizarre shape, with a leather strap wrapped around it. I walked over and picked it up and inspected the object, and could finally see that the object on the ground was some kind of bird beak. I could see a clear mouthpiece from behind its head, and it finally clicked in my mind. This was a whistle. I wiped the mouthpiece with my shirt and gave a small blow. The sound that came from it was horrifying. It was as if a demon had screeched from the depths of hell. I immediately stopped as this scared me more than it should have. I decided to call it a night and would have to check the rest of my traps later. I didn't want to be in the woods alone with whoever had dropped such a weird thing to have out in the woods. It also worried me that there was so much blood near the trap. Hopefully this was from some type of animal and not some vagabond out in the woods. I made my way walking through the dark woods, slowly glancing over my shoulder every couple of yards. Thankfully I was armed. My night vision goggles enhanced my vision so that the darkness had no effect on me. But even after those two facts, I still felt vulnerable. It was as if I could feel some type of evil lurking in the forest behind me. Once I finally reached the edge of the woods, I made my way over to the barn and placed the fur inside. I quickly cleaned it, stretched its fur, and saved its meat. A task that usually takes around 30 minutes to do. I then made my way inside and showed my mom the weird device I found. This time I was able to get a better look at it, in proper light. It was made from a dark type of wood, and was rather intricate. 
Immediately, my mom hated the sight of it. That's such a gross thing. You found that in the woods? Clearly, my mom was not amused. She asked me to throw it away, but I thought it was kind of cool. I knew it would make a perfect prank for my unsuspecting friends the next time I saw them. I put all my stuff away and charged my batteries for my goggles. I would have to wake up early and check my traps before school since I chickened out tonight. I hated getting up early, but I had to do it anyways to feed the horses and put them back out in the field. I got up the next morning at 4.30, as I normally did. I got the horses out, which doesn't take too much time, and fed them. I then remembered that I still had half my traps to check from yesterday. I went back inside and grabbed my gear. I grabbed my shotgun and my goggles, but sitting next to them was that weird whistle. For whatever reason, I put the whistle around my neck and went out into the woods. The sun wouldn't begin to rise for another hour or so, so I immediately turned on the goggles and went into the woods. I checked on my traps from yesterday and still nothing. Thankfully, these ones hadn't been set off yet. I then hiked down to the river in hopes for finding a beaver or something, but nothing. I crossed over and checked my last couple of traps when something caught my eye. About 50 yards away, in between the thick layer of trees, I saw a bizarre sight. It appeared that someone was kneeling down by one of my traps. At first, I thought the worst. I thought that I had accidentally ensnared someone, but something told me to hide. I watched as whoever this was began to slightly move from side to side. I silently watched closer and was able to see that a woman was eating whatever was trapped inside. I froze. Fear gripped me in a way that my mind was racing a million miles a second. I gripped my shotgun, hoping that I wouldn't have to use it. But then an idea came into my mind. I climbed a tree next to me as silently as I could, about 30 feet up or so. I then grabbed the whistle and blew into it, releasing the screams of the damned. The woman jumped up, but didn't run. I had clearly startled whoever it was, but instead of being the funniest thing, I slowly became horrified. The figure was clearly a woman with long, dark hair, but so many things were off about her. Fresh blood was still dripping from her mouth and hands as she frantically searched around her. I had startled this person, but I was the one who was now afraid. She then moved awfully quick in my direction before emitting a sound that made me afraid. She screeched the same sound that came from my whistle. She slowly came closer in my direction, and I tried my best not to move. My shotgun was on my back, but I was too afraid to move to get it. The woman was now beneath my tree, glancing in all directions, looking for me. I could smell her. She was that close. I could now see her hair was frayed and matted like some kind of wild animal. She was sniffing rapidly, as if she could smell me, but she quickly passed by me and headed in the direction of my house. I waited until she was out of sight before I even dared to move. She was so quick that I was afraid that she'd get me once I jumped down from my safe position. The sun began to slowly rise before I finally felt safe enough to come down from the tree. Once down, I immediately grabbed my shotgun and held it ready to shoot. I started to jog back and stayed on high alert before finally reaching my house. Thankfully, I didn't see any sign of that woman. I had wasted a good bit of my morning out there, but I still had time for school before it started. My mom was making breakfast for my dad when I went inside. They were both busy with what they were doing, so they ignored me. I went to my room and put my stuff away, making sure my goggles were charged. All day throughout school, I couldn't help but think what had happened this morning. The woman I saw was clearly demented, but eating raw animals in the woods was something else. I still couldn't get over how fast she was, or how she was able to produce such a terrible sound. It was almost inhuman. School eventually ended, and I drove home. Thankfully, both parents' cars were home, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The horses in the back were moseying about, as they always did but the woods looked especially menacing. I didn't feel like going back there, especially past the creek. I got home, did my homework, and did my chores around the farm. I got done early thanks to my dad helping me. The day was pretty warm, and he gave me the option to leave the horses out tonight, even though the morning events caused me to want to put them away. But he was right. It was probably good for them 
to be able to get the extra time out in the field to run around. That barn was so old and dusty that any time I went in there, I could feel my life quality go down slightly. Instead of going into the woods to collect my small game, I decided to play it safe. Much to my surprise of my parents, this was quite out of the ordinary for me. Instead, I just stayed inside and worked on a school project that wasn't due for another three weeks. Night eventually came, and the warmth of the day seemed to still hang in the air for most of it. It was so nice that my dad offered to fire up the grill in the backyard and cook up his famous ribs for dinner. But I declined. I made the excuse that I wasn't feeling well and that I didn't have much of an appetite, and I didn't want to waste his world-famous ribs on me, who wouldn't be able to fully appreciate them due to sickness. Instead, we stayed inside, and Mom cooked up some leftover spaghetti, which was a far cry from the ribs, but it got the job done. I went to bed at a normal time, which was somewhat early for me, but I was quickly awakened to the sound of our horses whining. As usual, I could hear my dad thundering through the house and out the back door. I sat up in bed and began to stretch as I heard my dad shouting. I was confused. Normally, when there was a predator outside, he would just fire a warning shot, or if they were actively attacking one of her horses, he would shoot in its direction, but he was shouting as if he was speaking to someone. You shouldn't be here. This is private property. I could tell by the volume of shouting that he was walking further out into the field. I then heard a gunshot coming from out in the field, but what followed caused me to freeze in terror. That same blood-curdling scream followed the gunshot. It was loud, almost the same volume as the gunshot, and then another blast from my dad's gun, and then another. The screaming continued way past the gunfire. My mom then came into my room. Dear, something's not right. I need you to take your gun and go find your father. My mom was holding her concealed pistol, which she never carried. I got out of bed and headed for my dad's gun safe. My mom punched in the code and opened it, and I grabbed a 12-gauge and loaded it. I was so panicked and worried, I didn't even think to grab my goggles, thinking that my dad should just be out in the field. I opened the back door and went outside. The floodlights facing the woods illuminated the backyard with artificial light, permitting me to see a good portion of the field. I could see all the horses ran to one side of the field except for one that lay lifeless on the far end. I could see the grass around it, littered with spurts of blood. I knew what had happened before I went outside, but it only confirmed what terrors waited for me out in those woods. Before I left my porch, my mother handed me a mag light, and I sprinted in the direction of the horse. I didn't know what to do, but I went in that direction. I thought my father would have done the same. I got about halfway to the horse, and I could see his shotgun laying on the ground. My dad was one heck of a shot, and not much scared him. I couldn't imagine something grabbing him without him putting a couple of holes in it first. I looked around for any signs of blood or whatever this thing was, and I was right. There was a thick black liquid with small chunks of flesh heading out into the forest. I didn't hesitate, and I rushed into the woods looking for any signs of my dad. It didn't take long for the trail to slowly fade, but the smell began to get stronger. I knew I was close. I shined my light all around when it finally landed on a dark mass, dragging my father away by his leg. He was laying face down, and his leg was bent at a terrible angle, as the same woman from this morning limped away, struggling to move him. I didn't give any warning, and I aimed for her head. I knew at this distance it would only pepper her, but I just hoped that it was enough for her to stop and turn around, giving me her full attention. I fired, and I saw a clump of her hair fly up, nearly knocking her over and causing her to drop my dad. She turned around and let out another horrible scream. I cocked the shotgun, and to my surprise, this was enough to scare her. She sprinted off into the woods, screaming while doing so. I rushed over to my dad, who was unresponsive. I checked his pulse, and by some miracle, he was still alive. I dropped the flashlight and the shotgun, and began to pull on the back of my dad's shirt, back into the backyard. I tried not to look at him, as he was torn up so badly. My strength could only take us so far for so long. I got him back to the edge of the woods and had to leave him there. 
I sprinted to the barn and grabbed a saddle and some rope. I called over one of the horses, but they were still too spooked to come near the edge of the woods. Tears filled my eyes as I screamed for any of the horses to come. Finally, one did, and I saddled up in record time and tore off into the direction where I left my dad. Thankfully, he was still there. I tried to pick him up, but he was too heavy. I then did the only thing I could do, and tied a loose loop around my dad's torso and tied it to the saddle. I made sure to walk the horse back slowly, as to not cause more damage to my dad. I got him back as close as I could to the house. By that time, my mom was crying outside. The police were called once my dad went missing, so they got there not much later. We got to the hospital, and to my surprise, he ended up surviving, but at a very high cost. His leg was shattered and almost needed to be amputated. His abdomen had several deep cuts and scratches that caused internal bleeding, which required several surgeries, but the worst part was his memory. He had suffered such head trauma that it took him several weeks to be able to recognize me or my mother. Since then, my mother had sold that farm. We moved in with my mother's parents, who were a couple of states away. Needless to say, we're all quite glad that we don't have to go back to those woods. Story 2 the Stalking Gray. My dad and my uncle took me and my brother on one of those guided hunting tours out in Alaska. You know the kind, where you pay a lot of money for some guy to take you out into the middle of the woods to hunt any type of game you want for a small fortune. My dad and uncle had started a company a while ago, and since then has made them way too much money. I'm not complaining. I'm currently 14 and my younger brother is 10. I have a younger sister, but she was not included in this trip for obvious reasons. In order to get to where we were needing to go, we needed to fly in a small airplane to a local airport and drove another couple hours out in the middle of nowhere. My dad and uncle were wanting big game trophy, something to look good in their pretentious corporate office or executive lobby. I think my dad was going for some type of large moose and my uncle wanted a grizzly bear. Obviously, my brother and I were just there for the ride, and to hopefully get a chance to shoot something while we were out there. If I was being completely honest, I think my mom wouldn't let my dad go hunting for a week while she was home with all the kids. So I guess that's the reason why we all went. We landed in a barren brown field airstrip with small buildings lining the wood line. It was freezing there. An old man was waiting for us with a green lifted truck and pretty decent sized tires. Anywhere else, a truck like this would have been a menace. But given the area, this looked more practical than anything. As we exited the plane, the man slowly waddled his way over and introduced himself as Val. He was an older man, probably in his 60s. He had a long white beard and a huge gut, making him look like a flannel version of Santa Claus, except he didn't like to smile. Sitting on his waist was a huge revolver and a tan-colored holster that looked custom. This would be our hunting guide, and basically caretaker for the next week. My dad and uncle didn't have a survival bone in their body, so Val was basically the only person going to keep us alive out in the middle of nowhere. After a brief moment of stretching on the landing strip, we all loaded up into the green truck. My brother and I sat in the back with my uncle, while my dad sat up front. The drive was maybe an hour or two, but it felt longer. During the drive, the scenery had greatly changed. The dry, barren field in which we landed set the tone for what was about to come in regards to our surroundings. Things would only get colder and more dreary. The sun was hidden behind thick, dark clouds that cast a dull light from the heavens. We drove through some beautiful mountain passes that looked untouched from human eyes, their beauty being held ransom by the negative masses of weather clouds that terrorized all forms of life that lived here. Some of these places looked as if we could perhaps be the only people to have ever been here. The longer we drove, the higher and thicker the snow fell. The pure snow mixed with the harsh browns and grays gave startling contrast between the two, making it difficult to take in the natural beauty. The dirt path slowly transformed into a trail of dirty snow. Thick trees began to fill in the sides of the road as we drove through the barren landscape. We finally arrived at a decent cabin, with several snowmobiles sitting out front. 
Next to the snowmobiles were several pieces of hide being stretched on some type of small structure. The various hides varied in both size and color. The cabin itself was made of a plastic siding rather than logs and looked more of a small house than it did a cabin. The snow up here was piled up a few feet and looked mostly undisturbed. A small pathway had been cleared, but it was soon piling up as fresh new snow began to fall. We'll get you situated for tonight, and we'll start first thing tomorrow, Val said as he exited the truck. My brother Zach and I grabbed our bags from the back and followed behind both my dad and my uncle as Val led us inside. Inside the cabin was surprisingly typical of what you would assume a hunting guide's cabin to look like. Several pieces of big game hung on the wall, as well as thick luscious rugs sprawled across the floors and backs of couches and chairs. A half dozen pieces of collector quality firearms hung in both cases and commemorative racks as their metal glinted light from the crackling fire in the fireplace. Luscious furs hung on the walls of beautiful animals. The home could not be more cozy, and rightfully so. The bitterness of outside contrasted well, and anyone even with the highest standards of comfort could find relaxation amidst this horrible weather. Inside we were shown our room, which we would all share. The room was quite large, but to our surprise, several bunk beds lined the wall. The level of decoration had clearly taken a step back. The room was still nice, but it was clear that design was not its main function. Val shown us around briefly and let us know the schedule for the upcoming week. While giving us the grand tour, Val produced a small orange canister, very similar to a prescription bottle, and quickly took two pills while rubbing his chest. Y'all do whatever you want tonight, but make sure you're up ready for tomorrow. We got a big day ahead of us. My brother and I couldn't help but notice the cabin didn't have Wi-Fi or even a TV. This was devastating, but I suppose that this was the idea. Val retreated into the only room he didn't show us, which I assumed to be his personal quarters. It was only 5.30, and Val went to his room early for the night. My dad... Uncle and brother did the only thing we could do, which was find food in the kitchen and play cards all night. The nighttime was surprisingly festive. Despite my dad and uncle complaining about the poor beer selection of the cabin, the night was filled with festivities. My parents had had issues for a while. Dad was normally under a lot of stress from work, and at home, he and my mom would often bicker over nonsense. It was good to see him with his brother, being a goofball that I knew he was. It made me and my brother almost envious of their amazing relationship with one another. My uncle kept the fire going as the night went on. The sun had almost set immediately after arriving, but all four of us were too excited to go to bed early. Seeing how none of our phones worked out here, and there wasn't a TV to watch, we decided to tell stories. Most of them funny stories, either from my dad or uncle about their past, but there were also some that were just random ideas that were fun to talk about. My uncle mentioned that Alaska, believe it or not, was a hotbed for UFO and paranormal activity. He had shared many stories from friends and co-workers on how someone had been stalked for months before being abducted by aliens. My brother and I listened in awe the further we went into his drunken rabbit hole of a journey. Surprisingly to both me and my brother, my dad chimed in, saying that he not only thought aliens were real, but were also working with the government. The prospect of hunting big game was no longer the main focus that kept both my brother and I awake. It was now the idea that aliens were going to come and get us. My brother and I laid awake in our bunks as the four of us sat in the room waiting for sleep to find us. Six o'clock rolled around and a loud knock was heard on the door. Light spilled in from under the door as a shadow could be seen moving past. My dad turned on the light in the room and instantly my head was filled with pain. I probably got no more than four hours of sleep thanks to those scary stories. It took us what felt like forever to get ready. We probably put on one too many layers of clothes, but that was fine with us. We were going to be outside all day, so we tried to plan accordingly. We all left our room and we could hear a sizzling coming from the kitchen. The smell of thick bacon filled the warm cabin, luring us in there. Val was making us breakfast, that of which contended any meal I'd ever had. Hope you guys are hungry. I'm on what you call the non-vegan diet. 
Val said, revealing a toothy grin. This was the first time that Val had smiled. I now understood why he didn't smile much. Before he added the finishing touches to our breakfast, he retrieved his orange container of pills and shook it. The sound of nothing came forth. Ah, shoot. I'll be alright for a few days, he said under his breath while putting away the orange container in his shirt pocket. Val then loaded up her plates with hefty servings of eggs, bacon, and sausage. Hope you're hungry. This is both breakfast and lunch. My brother and I shared a glance of both delight and surprise. This alone might be the best vacation we'd ever been on. After an hour of scarfing down arguably one of the best meals I'd ever had, we then went outside and stood by the snowmobiles. It was still dark out. Val loaded up three snowmobiles and gave both my dad and uncle a quick rundown of the day and how to operate the machines in a safely manner before we departed from the cabin. The snowmobiles ripped through the snow as we rode through the woods on a mostly cleared path. The lights on the machine spewed a ghastly yellow light that filled a small area of view in front of us. Our speeds were reduced due to the lack of visibility. After an hour of riding in almost complete darkness, the sun slowly began to rise, giving life to this barren wasteland. Once the sun was up to actually see something, we then began to floor it to our destination. We rode in the empty field single file until Val eventually slowed down and we came to a stop. Val set up some type of blind and we all got inside. The temperature was virtually the same inside and I could tell that it was going to be cold all day. Val handed both my dad and uncle rifles. We sat for hours waiting for a large game to come into our field. There was a time or two when Val would reach for his pills but would instantly remind himself that he was out of them. Halfway through the day, we could hear wolves off in the distance. My brother and I looked shocked at one another, and Val laughed. Now who can tell me why that's a good sign, Val said, again concealing his smile. My dad, surprisingly enough, guessed right. Wolves nearby. That must mean there's something for them to hunt. Am I right, Val? Val couldn't hold back his smile. Wow, you city slickers aren't too shabby. That's right. My brother couldn't help but pipe in. Should we be worried about the wolves? Are they going to come get us? Val leaned back in his camping chair. Nah, there's nothing to worry about. I'll get them before they get us. And even then, you could just ride back to the cabin on the snowmobiles, and they couldn't get you. My brother and I understood the reasoning, but the thought that a pack of vicious predators looming outside could not escape our minds. If we knew anything about wolves... We knew that they were smart. That's what scared us the most. After some time, a small herd of moose eventually came into our field. Can we get these ones? My dad asked, clearly excited to finally get some action. Vale looked through his binoculars for a brief moment and nodded. Yeah, there's one in there with your name on it. We gotta let them get close enough. The moose slowly meandered their way over. Vale made sure to point out which one to shoot and my dad took aim. A brief moment of silence hung before a loud crack boomed from his rifle. A small mist of pink exploded on the moose's shoulder, and they all scattered. The moose then took off and ran towards the woods that was a ways away in the distance. Val looked through his binoculars and back at my dad. You hit him solid, but it wasn't a kill shot. Let's just hope we can find him. Val exited the blind and we all followed. He roughed up one of the snowmobiles, and he and my dad hopped on and drove off into the direction of the moose. We waited back at the blind with my uncle, as Val and my dad searched for the moose. It was around 2 in the afternoon, and we all began to get hungry. Dad and Val had been gone for about 20 minutes before we heard howling of the wolves in the distance. I wonder how far they are, my uncle said, giving both me and my brother a fright. Don't worry guys. I'll let them eat me before I let them eat you, he said, providing nearly no comfort in that statement. Finally, we could hear the roar of the snowmobile heading back. We all hopped out to see the two riding at a slower pace with a large dark mass sitting on the back. No way! That's awesome, Uncle Terry shouted as the two rode back victoriously. However, upon return, something was terribly wrong. Dad was now driving, and Val looked to be slouched over leaning on my dad's back. 
He rode up fast and jumped off. We need to head back now. I think Val's having some type of heart attack. Val sat on the snowmobile, clutching his chest and out of breath. He was pointing weakly before falling off the snowmobile. We all rushed over and sat him up, but he was unresponsive. He was still breathing, but barely. Okay, we need to get him out of here and back into town. We pushed off the prize moose off the snowmobile and loaded up and got out of there. We could now see the wolves a few hundred yards away, licking their chops seeing how we were going to leave them a big juicy moose for them to eat. We tore off in the direction where we thought the cabin was, in hopes for the best. Dad and Vale rode on one snowmobile, and my brother and I rode with Uncle Terry. Dad was doing his best to both drive and keep Vale upright, but it was difficult. We ended up having to sit me behind Vale to hold him up so Dad could drive. Val was heavy since he was no longer conscious. I fought back tears as I had to hold this man's limp body as we drove back to the cabin. It started to get late when Dad stopped again. At this point, we should have been back by now, but our scenery had hardly changed. We were still in this huge field. The clouds were working against us by holding back the sun yet again. Dad slowed up and we all met to discuss what to do. I couldn't help but notice that our fuel levels were less than half. Does any of this look familiar to you guys? My dad inquired. Uncle Terry and my brother were useless. We were clearly lost. We took a minute to check on Val when a familiar sound rang off in the distance. It was the howling of the wolves. We couldn't see them, but we could definitely hear them. It was likely that this was another set of wolves since we rode so far away from our hunting blind but that still didn't change the fact that they were nearby. My uncle then pointed off into the distance and began to shout. I see a light, he shouted. We all looked and sure enough, there appeared to be a radio tower way off into the distance, glowing a slow flashing red every few seconds. Terry, I don't think that's useful for us, my dad said. What do we even do with that? If that's a radio tower, that means there must be people nearby. It's our best bet. My dad pondered the thought and how much gas it would take for us to get there. Right then, as if on cue, a set of wolves howled again. Okay, let's check it out. We rode towards the tower, but it was clear that this would take us some time. It was likely that the gas in these snowmobiles would give out way before. Fear began to set in as we were clearly lost. Not only that, but if we didn't find shelter soon, we were going to be subjected to one of the worst possible deaths, which would either be freezing to death or eaten alive. We were only a few miles away from the tower when our snowmobiles began to slow down. My dad began slamming his hand on the machine as it was clear that we just ran out of gas. We pulled off and gathered together. At this point, Val was no longer breathing and he hadn't been for quite some time. The only plus side was that Terry's snowmobile still had some gas in it since it had less people on it. We were now in trouble. The realization that death was probably an option began to set in all over us. My dad got off the snowmobile and began loading whatever firearm he had. He took Terry's pistol and handed it to me and I began to cry again. I'm gonna need you and your brother to keep riding towards that light and try to find help for us. Uncle Terry and I are gonna stay back and take out whatever walls we can. Terry hopped off the snowmobile and began to sling a rifle on his shoulder. Don't worry guys, we're right behind you. We'll just keep walking till we catch up to you. Everything's gonna be okay. His false sense of calm was enough for me to wipe my tears and jump on the snowmobile. I'd never driven one of these before, so my dad had to give me a quick rundown of how to operate it before I could drive it. I double checked where to drive and I took off with my brother, leaving my dad and uncle behind. The red light became brighter the darker it got. It only took us 20 minutes, but we finally arrived at the tower. To our surprise, at the base of the tower was a small building. We hopped off the snowmobile and tried the door, but it was locked. We tried knocking, but obviously no answer. The building was probably some maintenance shed or something, but it was better than nothing. I did the only thing I thought to do, which was to shoot the door handle. I shot it once, but to no effect. I held the gun closer, and with two hands this time, and fired again. The kick from the gun caused me to drop it. I picked it up and prepared for a third shot, 
but saw that the door was slightly opened. A sense of relief washed over me as I pushed myself inside, only to be confused for what waited for us. Once inside, my brother and I came face to face with an unusual sight. In front of us, leading downwards, was a long set of stairs. Dull red lights lined the wall, showing us that the stairs descended a good ways down. What is this place? My brother whispered. Making sure not to startle anyone, I put the gun away, just on the off chance that we came across someone that lived here. The stairs were metallic, and the walls were a gray concrete. I slowly walked down the stairs with my brother behind me. The red bulbs produced enough light to make the next few stairs visible, but not much after. After a few minutes of uneasiness, we reached the bottom. At the bottom of the stairs, a long hallway spanned in both directions. Small yellow lights were placed at predetermined intervals, and it appeared that the doors were in between them. The question of what this place was, and what I was doing here, was not immediately answered. If anything, this added more questions. I was personally torn at the moment. I knew that I had to find a way to get us help out here, here in the middle of nowhere. But for whatever reason, my mind was telling me I was at a place I shouldn't be. Seeing how my back was against the wall, I had no other choice. I'm sure that one of these rooms had a telephone or perhaps a desktop computer in which we could ask for help. My brother Levi was petrified, not being able to leave my side at all for anything. It took me a few minutes, but I finally came up with a game plan. We need to check all the rooms and see if there's anything that we could do to get us out of here. Levi didn't respond. We went to the first door and surprisingly enough, it was unlocked. Inside the room were a bunch of filing cabinets and other office supplies except a telephone and a computer. We proceeded down the line of each room until we finally came across something bizarre. Instead of a room in between the lights and the hallway was what looked like some kind of holding cell. The cell was empty, but frantic writings could be seen all over the walls and the ceiling. Whoever they were holding in here was clearly crazy. The mystery of this place was far from being answered. Finally, one of the rooms was able to shine some light on what was going on here. A wall of old monitors illuminated the dark room. Most of the screens were static, but some of them had black and white images of mostly empty cells in the hallway. The age of the monitors and the quality of the picture made this facility seem dated. By the looks of everything so far, this place was not only abandoned, but at one point was probably ran by the government or some bizarre security company. Some of the cells were empty, but had a dark liquid scattered across the holding area. Below the monitors were buttons, knobs, and dials, seemingly to control this entire facility. Finally, a red telephone sat in the corner of the control board, with a red flashing light above it. It took me a second to realize that this was a way to get out of here. My stomach growled, and my head began to hurt from the lack of food. It was around 6 now, and me and my brother had gone 12 hours without any food or water. I picked up the phone not caring about the potential consequences other than being rescued from this arctic wasteland. I picked up the phone and instead of a dial tone, a quick sequence of beeps and tones rang and then a voice. A confused voice. Department of Defense, who is it Beast Whiskey? This was unexpected. I was stunned and not prepared to talk to someone so quickly. Uh, this is Garrett. We're in trouble. The man that we were with is dying and we found this building by accident. A brief silence hung on the phone. The person who had answered began typing furiously. Before I could say anything, the operator came back on. Listen, Garrett. Where you are now is not safe. You need to leave immediately. I just dispatched a helicopter to come and get you. But you need to leave the facility right now. Your safety is on the line. But it's dark out and a pack of wolves have us cornered inside. The operator didn't seem to care. Listen, kid, I can't tell you much, but there's something in there that's much worse inside that base, and you need to leave. The chopper will be there in just under two hours. If you can hold off for that long, then you'll be okay. Great. Just when I thought we were saved, the operator told us to go back outside into the danger. I hung up the phone, 
and the dread of going out into the dark, cold night began to sink in. I turned to find my brother, but he was gone. I glanced over to the door, and sure enough, it was opened. He must have snuck out over the short period of time it took me to talk to the operator. I searched the office area frantically for any type of flashlight, but nothing. I entered the hallway and had a 50-50 shot in guessing which direction I needed to go to find my brother. Considering we've been going left, I continued in that direction, hoping my brother had the same train of thought as I did. I didn't want to listen to the operator's instructions. The cold alone was enough to deter anyone from going outside, but for whatever reason, the franticness of his instructions told me that perhaps there was an unseen danger inside this base that we didn't know about. I figured that I'll decide what to do once I found my brother. I continued walking down the hallway, looking for any signs of my brother, or even what this base was used for. After about 10 minutes of walking straight down the hall, trying to open any door I could, I finally came across a bizarre sight. There was a doorway missing a door. A dark substance scattered across the entryway and the floor leading inside. Seeing how I didn't have any formal light, Aside from the emergency lights that lined the hallway, I decided that I was not going to enter this room. I quietly shuffled past as I remembered the operator's instructions. I passed that room and continued walking when I heard a strange noise inside. I stopped. Did my brother go in there without any light? My brother, like any 10 year old, was curious, but sure he had some form of self-preservation. He was fairly smart, but was he daring enough to go inside? Time was of the essence, and I walked back over to the doorway. The room must have been large since the small amount of light from the emergency lights didn't even begin to illuminate any part of the room. My eyes strained to see anything, but it was pointless. However, a thought crept into my mind, a very silly one, but it was better than going inside. I decided to whisper, Levi! in hopes of drawing out my brother. The sound that I originally heard repeated, but much closer. I could hear footsteps of something coming closer to the opening of the room where I stood. My instincts began to shout. I wanted to see what would emerge out of that room, but I made sure not to stand right in front of it. I did the only thing I could do and ran down a couple doors and laid down on the floor in between the red emergency lights. I waited for a few seconds to see if anything would emerge from the dark room but nothing ever did. I got up, feeling silly and walked back to the room and glanced inside. To my horror, my eyes glanced on one of the most horrific things a 14-year-old boy could see in that setting, let alone being in the middle of nowhere. What I saw was a tall figure walking back into the room, but whoever it was didn't have any clothes on. The skin of whoever it was appeared to be burned, but that wasn't the worst part. The figure was tall, inhumanely tall. The red and black scorch marks looked leathery and scabbed over. Rows of ribs stuck out, almost protruding from the skin. The shoulders and hips looked exaggerated, sticking out far past what a normal person should have. The arms that hung off to the side looked long and thin, looking as if it had no discernible muscle mass. It was impossible to assign a gender to this creature, seeing how the hair had been burnt off. The only thing to keep my mind from delving into madness was that I was not able to see its face. I can't imagine how something so distorted could live down here for so long. The beastly figure continued its stride back into the darkness. I then now realized what the operator was trying to tell me, and he was right. I waited by the door just hoping this thing wouldn't come back, and when I felt safe, I silently took off. The search for Levi would have to wait, and I made my way back to the initial staircase. Out of instinct and morbid curiosity, I glanced back, hoping to see an empty hallway and that nothing had followed me back to the entrance. But a wave of terror washed over my body as I could see a tall figure standing outside of the room, staring at me. The red light made visibility incredibly difficult, but surely there stood a hulking figure standing in the middle of the hallway. At that distance, no features were discernible, and I thank God for that. I didn't wait to see what it did, I just sprinted. 
I sprinted up the long set of stairs which took most of my energy and ran outside. I pushed open the door and fell into the snow. It was dark out and colder than I remember. A single yellow bulb lit up the entrance door, giving a small area of comfort in such an inhospitable part of the world. I pulled out my pistol and held it close as I waited for help to come. I listened for help in the howling wind, but I had no clue how far out they were. The coldness made everything difficult, even breathing. My eyes hurt from the frosty air, but sure enough, they were able to detect another figure walking towards me in the snow. This one was bundled up, but its identity was unknown. I pointed my weapon at the figure, but I kept my finger off the trigger. My arm shook as the person got closer, and it wasn't until they got within 30 feet that I realized that it was my uncle. I lowered my weapon and ran to him. He didn't even see me coming, and I hugged him tight. Uncle Terry, you're alive. Where's my dad? Uncle Terry's face was red and black from the brutal wind and cold. He tried muttering something, but his face was frozen. I guided him back to the entrance of the base, but he pushed his way through the door and went inside. I was just grateful that I was no longer alone and to be out of the cold. I didn't tell him yet about what was in here. He immediately collapsed on the floor, and I began taking off what spare parts of clothing I could to try to cover him. Uncle Terry shook as I placed what little I could to keep him warm. The base wasn't terribly warm, but it got us out of that nasty wind which made all the difference. Finally, after 20 minutes he was able to stop shaking and sat up. I stood guard by the top of the stairs and held my pistol to the side. Uncle Terry said something that I had figured when I saw him alone. Your father. They got him, Terry said in a raspy and worn voice. I tried to take out as many as I could, but there were too many. I didn't respond. I just stared at the floor. Where's Levi? Terry said. I turned to face him, but I was speechless. My thoughts were torn between a million things and what to say, but all that came out was, we shouldn't be here. I began to cry, and Terry looked at me with a confused look. Of course we shouldn't be here. We should be back at the cabin eating moose steaks, he said, trying to lighten the mood. No, Terry, we shouldn't be here, I said while pointing down the stairs. There's something down there. Levi and I got split up and I saw something. There's some kind of sick man down there. I don't think he saw Levi, but I think he saw me. Uncle Terry stood up and hugged me. I handed him my pistol. I also called for help, though. I said while trying to keep my crying down. Terry looked at me with an astonished look. You did? What did he say? His countenance went from a dead man to a man of action, almost immediately. They said that they're sending a chopper, but it would take them just under two hours. That was an hour ago. They also told me that something dangerous was here. I think it was the man that I saw. Terry walked over to the stairs and looked down. You talked to somebody? On the phone? And you said that someone else is here? Show me. Terry, please, don't make me go down there, I said whimpering. Garrett, it's gonna be okay. You said your brother's down there with some strange man. We need to find him. My uncle added a layer of comfort, but whatever that thing was was clearly something I wasn't supposed to see. Seeing how I was still hesitant... My uncle assured me that, even if there was the scariest man alive there with them, he was no match with my uncle with a gun. He then held my hand and began walking down the stairs. I hesitated at first, but I soon found myself following behind my uncle back into the place I never wanted to go. Once we reached the bottom, I instructed him in the direction in which I saw the phone. I told him that that was also the same way where I saw the strange man. My uncle then yelled, startling me, my brother's name, but no response. Keep an eye out for your brother, he said, as we walked in the direction of the monitor room. Fear gripped me as my uncle slowly walked down the hallway. I knew that ahead of me was a death trap, but it was also the only way that I wouldn't be alone. Seeing how my alternatives were to go back into the freezing night, I went against my instinct and slowly walked down the dark hallway. 
My decision was immediately proven wrong, as both my uncle and I heard crying coming from the dark depths of the long hallway. The scream was gut-wrenching, and immediately caused both my uncle and I to stop on our tracks. But not only that, but the screams of my brother could be heard coming from the same direction. The fear of safety immediately was overshadowed by the unfortunate reality that whatever this thing was that was down here with us had my brother. My uncle sprung into action, and I followed as closely as I could behind him, but of course I fell behind. He immediately turned into the room where I saw the tall naked man, and he paused. The screams from both my brother and the tall man continued as I approached the doorway. I stopped and looked at my uncle as he hesitated. Fear consumed both of us, but the screams inside must have pushed him over the edge as he entered into the dark room. I waited outside as gunshots were heard from inside, briefly illuminating the dark room. My uncle got two shots off, and I could briefly saw the tall man crouching on the corner and then standing to face my uncle. I waited for a third shot, but it never came. My brother's cries had stopped and were now replaced by my uncle's screams. It was one thing to hear a child scream, but a grown adult crying from pain and fear is another. I did the only thing I could do and turn and ran. I ascended the stairs a second time, all the while my uncle was crying for help. I felt useless, knowing that I was about to share a gruesome death much like my brother and uncle. I got to the top of the stairs and rushed outside. The screams were no longer able to reach my ears, as the howling wind of the Alaskan night bit at my face. My tears caused my face to hurt even more, as the cold caused them to freeze. I just laid down, hoping that the chopper would get here before the cold would take me, or even the pack of wolves that were surely not too far off. My body was numb, and I was so tired. My stomach was now completely empty, and it began to cause actual pain. The chopper holding both pilots and a squad of soldiers finally caught sight of the radio tower that was still blinking its dull red light amidst the dark backdrop. The weather was terrible for flying, yet they were approved to fly out to the secret location for an emergency extraction. The pilot buzzed over the intercom system, saying that he'd get as close as he could to the entrance, but that it was going to be bumpy due to the wind. From the sky, the pilots could see the entrance door ripped off the hinges and a pack of wolves fighting over a lifeless body laying face down in the snow. One of the soldiers opened the side door to the chopper and fired off into the side of the pack. The wolves scattered almost instantly, and the chopper was able to land. The four soldiers rushed over to the body, but not much remained. They were puzzled. The soldiers were only informed that this was a rescue mission and nothing else. They knew nothing about this base or what was inside. However, Commander Quentin was as brave as he was sharp. He knew two things about the call. The first was that a young boy said that he and his brother were inside and that they needed a rescue. Where was the other boy, and why was this one outside? The soldiers were ready to enter the base when he stopped them. Hold up, team. Something's not right. The soldier stopped, slightly frustrated that they had to wait in the cold. Why would this kid risk being out here rather than being inside? The soldiers were clueless. Commander Quentin made sure to turn off his comms so that only the soldiers in front of him could hear him. I've heard stories about places like this, out in the middle of nowhere. Some were research stations where scientists worked on top secret projects while others were secret blacklisted holding facilities for criminals and other high value targets. So, what's your point? Private Powell piped up. My point is, Private, is that there's something down there that made this poor kid take his chances with the wolves.